Good morning. In this video lecture, we'll be covering the stages of preschool and middle childhood psychosocial development, otherwise known as Chapter 10. <clears throat> so let's start with the preschool stage. These is ages four and five. Going back to our good friend Eric Erickson, the crisis is initiative versus guilt. Over here we have a little example of a child who is showing initiative. He poured his own juice, very exciting. And then one who would feel guilty because not only did he try to pour his own juice, he failed miserably and mom or dad or both are going to yell at him and make him feel bad. <clears throat> the primary strength at this point is purpose and the influence includes parents, family, and the school. Children at this point are doing things with a purpose. They want a specific outcome or to achieve a certain goal. Skills learned at this age. We have planning and organizing, basic personal care skills including buttons and zippers, basic physics, meaning they begin to understand that things roll down a hill, not up a hill, Things that are dropped can fall and break, so suddenly the game of tossing things on the floor is not quite as much fun as when you're a toddler. And courage and independence. Also at this age, they learn, begin to learn judgment. And this is especially true with risk-taking activities, such as riding a bike or crossing the street alone. Um, children at this age begin to set their own boundaries based on these judgments. So, for example, you know, a child may be um, quite willing to run around their backyard like a banshee, jumping, running, climbing trees, but they know that when they're in the front yard, there is cars coming, there are strangers around, and they're much less likely to run around uninhibited. <clears throat> now, what happens if things don't go as planned? Well, kids begin to feel shame, and this leads to what we call guilt, which is a new emotion for children, because, like I said, you never see a two-year-old who feels guilty. They're just a giant ball of id, to use Freud's term. They're working on impulse, and they want what they want when they want it now. Um, they can also feel frustration which can lead to aggressive behavior such as hitting or yelling. Not just hitting in other people, but they hit themselves sometimes. And this is really a manifestation of extreme frustration. When a child experiences a lot of shame and a lot of guilt, the child changes. They become more assertive. They become very aggressive, very inhibited though. They're not willing to try new things. Um, they become very dependent on the adults around them and the child is less willing to explore new situations and that's really the issue at this age is whether or not they're showing initiative or they feel shame about trying things because they don't think they'll be successful or that they will get in trouble. Now is all guilt bad? No. Actually some guilt is very good as most Catholic and Jewish mothers can tell you. Um, some guilt is important to create self-control in a healthy conscience. You have to know when you've done something wrong and if it's your fault. Um, here's a little uh, definition of guilt. It's a feeling of having committed wrong or failed in an obligation. So when we feel guilty that we forgot to get our mom a Mother's Day card, well you should feel guilty. And um, you know, along those lines, there are things that you should feel guilty for. That will help you curb bad behavior and improve behavior. But if you feel guilty or bad about almost everything you do, then you're running into that issue of you feel shame about taking initiative. Let's jump to middle childhood. This is ages six or seven to 11 or 12. It's in this time frame of elementary school. The Erickson crisis is industry versus inferiority. Um, you'll see over here in the little picture, you have one kid who's playing checkers and he says, this is easy. And then the other kid over here says, I don't get it. Now, 
Most people can figure out how to play checkers pretty quickly. It's not the most complex game. But the point being that children at this age are either going to feel that they can accomplish things and be successful or that anything they try they're terrible at so they're never going to try again and basically feel very inferior to those around them. The goal at this point is to learn how to create a productive situation that supersedes the whimsy of play. Now what that means is you have your average two-year-old or three-year-old. They want to play. They don't have a purpose behind the play. They just like to play. So whether they are playing princess, whether they're playing soldier, whether they're playing soccer but without rules, it's all about having fun. Now at this age during elementary school when we are learning a vast amount of information in our brains, we're learning about how we find success. You know, some kids are really, really smart, and when they get to school, they get all kinds of positive reinforcement. Oh my God, there's that term, positive reinforcement, and they will continue to do well in school. Other kids, they may get a lot of positive reinforcement when it comes to something like sports, so they will continue on at sports. But if you don't get any positive reinforcement from school, from sports, from music, from whatever you're trying, then you are going to feel ultimately inferior to those around you. Now the goal, like I said, you want to be productive. The main question is what am I good at? So during this stage, most of us are trying different things. We may try <clears throat> going to take music lessons. We might try different sports. We might try different kinds of classwork. You know, um, I was in a special program in fifth grade for people who had above average reading skills. And I think in a large part that helped me want to read more because I was being singled out as one of the four kids in the fifth grade who really could read well. And that made me feel good about myself and it made me read more. So you can't underestimate how much a little positive reinforcement can make to a child at this age. If a child doesn't achieve some level of success in their industriousness, it can result in the child isolating him or herself. If you don't feel like you're good at anything, you don't want to interact with others. You want to stay to yourself. You want to be almost that lone wolf, age eight, uh, just because you don't want to be called on the fact that you can't accomplish much. <clears throat> So let's look at the perceptual cognitive de developmental traits. Perception meaning how you see the world, cognitive how you think. So it's how you think about the world at this point. Um, you're learning the fundamentals of technology. Um, obviously in this day and age, you know, you can give a two-year-old a phone and they'll figure out how to use it. But now you're getting into the actual mechanics of how things work. And again, I'm not saying that you're going to understand um, the atomic makeup of every element in the universe. Rather, you're getting the general idea of what are the elements, how does technology work, how does TV work, how does um, the remote control work. You know, you can talk to your average eight-year-old and they probably know how to use the remote control better than grandma or grandpa, and in some cases, mom and dad. Um, they work hard at being responsible. They want to be a good kid, and they want to do things right. And this is really the era where you can make a huge impact on a child by giving them that positive reinforcement that says, you are a great kid, you're doing an awesome job in school, you're a great football player, great baseball, whatever, and it will stick. When they get to adolescence, 13, 14 years old, a parent's influence goes out the window. So this is really the time period that parents really need to emphasize the successes of their kids. Um, the kids are beginning to understand the concepts of time and space. They can read a clock. They understand distance. They know the difference between a mile and a hundred miles. They get a better understanding of cause and effect. 
and they begin to understand the calendar and clocks. Um, you know, the calendar, again, one of the big things that you see is, for example, you know, one of the great days in the year for a child is Christmas. Whether they are Christian or not, Christmas has become sort of a secular holiday. And boy, they can tell you exactly how many days until Christmas once we get past Thanksgiving. To continue on, we see children at this age eager to learn and accomplish more complex skills like writing, reading, and telling time. They form moral values. They know the difference between right and wrong. Um, and they understand the inherent nature of right and wrong, meaning, um, you know, it's wrong to hit your brother, but it's also wrong to hit a stranger. So they're beginning to understand not just things within the rules of their own little household, but in a larger sense. They're also beginning to recognize cultural and individual differences. And, you know, this is one of those moments that children who at five may not have had any concept that someone might be brown, someone might be dark brown, someone may be cafe au lait, someone might be very white. Now at around six and seven, it's becoming more understandable, more um, obvious to them. And um, just to share with you one of my childhood moments again when I was seven years old my best friend was an African-American named Angela and Angela and I always hung out we lived right across the street from each other and at some point Angela and I kind of thought about well why is she brown and I am and I called myself peach in those days although I'm shock white th these days so I asked my mom and my mom said that people are like ice cream that there's different flavors of people. Now, at seven, this made perfect sense to me. And, um, you know, kudos to mom for explaining race in such a uh, easy to understand way. But, you know, what this does is it gives kids an understanding that people can be different, but people are also basically the same. So in the same way that it didn't matter if I had chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream, I loved ice cream, it didn't matter if my friends were brown or white or any other color because they were all awesome kids. As a postscript to that story, I went back and told my friend Angela about this. And um, we did what any seven-year-old would do is we tried licking each other and tasting to see if we did taste chocolate and vanilla, which sadly we did not. But it did make both of our parents very concerned about our behavior. Anyway. Um, kids at this age are able to manage most of their personal needs in grooming with minimal assistance. Um, they can brush their teeth, they can chrome their hair, they can take a shower by themselves or a bath by themselves. And it really does free up mom and dad to kind of live their own lives a little bit more. But kids at this age also express their independence by being disobedient. And what most of them do, and not all of them, but most of them, is they use backtalk to be rebellious. They are exerting their sense of independence, their sense of autonomy. And if a child is backtalking to you at eight, nine years old, that means that you've done a good job. They are trying to define themselves in an otherwise group identity. So let's specifically talk about industrious versus inferiority. Children at this age must feel success in something. If the child does not experience success, they begin to feel inferior or incompetent. So, again, a child who doesn't have the options of finding out what they're good at, and this is really the parent's job. So let's say you sign up your little boy for football, and he is not interested at all, nor is he any good. As soon as the ball is thrown to him, he jumps out of the way. So, okay, so football may not be a sport. So you sign him up for soccer lessons. And again, as soon as the ball comes to him, he runs away. So you figure, okay, maybe sports are not his thing. So you sign him up for music lessons. And maybe music is not his thing. Then you sign him up for karate lessons. And then all of a sudden, it clicks. The point is that as a parent, it is our job to find out what our f kids can be good at and never giving up. You know, some children are going to be good at almost everything. They are competitive, 
highly motivated young people. But some kids are just not good at things. You know, my one nephew, he had struggled through most of his young adulthood trying to find something that he was really good at. And, um, you know, when he got to junior high and high school, it was realized that he was actually a great singer and a wonderful performer. And he got into the theater department and really became a social butterfly, and it made him feel really good. That's the thing, is you can't let your child ever give up. If they just sit in their room playing video games all day, which is, you know, fine for a couple hours, but you have to give them some diversity of experience. Now, too much industry leads to what we call virtuosity. And this means that children act like mini adults. They don't act like children. And in this kind of a case, you see young people who are literally the breadwinners in their family, especially in a place like Hollywood. Um, there's a story about an actress who was a teen star back in the 1970s. And she used to come to work, she was eight or nine years old, and she had a little briefcase with her script and her script notes. And, you know, she was making the money for her family. You know, go forward 20 years, and you have somebody like Lindsay Lohan, who was great as a kid. You know, people loved her. People still talk about Freaky Friday and Mean Girls and, you know, those shows that she was on that people really enjoyed. But, you know, this kid was ra was not just supporting herself she was supporting her whole family and in this particular scenario both her mother and father are kind of nuts and idiots so as an adult now she is lost in drugs and alcohol um, so too much virtuosity can be very very challenging for young people you have to let them be kids one of the main jobs of an adult parent is nurturing a child's self-esteem. Robert Brooks is a big expert on self-esteem and resilience and he recommends the following. Understand and accept children's learning problems. If a child has, for example, dyslexia or ADHD or some other perceptual problem, instead of burying your head in the sand, you have to get them help. You have to find a resource for them that will help them because these are all things that can be overcome. You have to highlight the child's strengths. Teach children how to solve problems and make decisions. If you always solve the problem your child is experiencing, sure, you're going to be superwoman or superman, but eventually the children have to learn how to solve their own problems. Um, reinforce responsibility by having children c contribute. You know, something as sm minor as little chores around the house become very, very significant. So a two or three year old, yeah, they're not going to be able to do the dishes, but they can pick up their toys and put them in the toy box. As they get older, more age appropriate chores can be added and it reinforces that they are an integral part of the family dynamic. Also, learn from mistakes rather than feeling defeated and pass that along to your children. When they don't do well in something, instead of punishing them outright, find out why they didn't do well in something. What was it that led to them not doing well? And then finding a way to overcome those problems. Last but not least, and this is probably the most important, is make the child feel special creates special times alone with the child each week. Even just taking your kid to McDonald's for lunch on Saturday afternoon while your spouse is sleeping late can be an awesome experience. One or two hours a week alone with your child doing whatever. You can play miniature golf, you can go shopping, you can have lunch, you can just sit and watch a movie together. But it's going to make that child feel special, and especially if there are multiple children in a household. Giving them a couple hours each alone each week is going to make them bond with their parent and give them some one-on-one -on -one time. And that's really what we all want from mom and dad is attention. One of the big research questions that has been examined over the last 50 years is, about our personality. And the question is, is it set by age seven? 
Um, Christopher Nave is a researcher at the University of California, and he found four specific characteristics of seven-year-olds um, that tend to stay consistent over a 50-year time period. So he is looking at data that encompasses 50 years, starting with kids who were interviewed back in 1964. So these attributes are <coughs> talkativeness, otherwise verbal fluency, adaptability, how well we cope with new situations, impulsiveness, do we act on instinct without thinking decisions through, and self-minimizing behavior. Essentially, being humble to the point of minimizing one's importance. So let's talk in more detail about talkativeness and verbal fluency. The research findings demonstrate that kids who are talkative at age seven grow up to be intellectual, good speakers, tendency to want to control things, and are highly intelligent. So a seven-year-old who's very talkative is a good sign for who they're going to grow up to be. Kids who are not talkative grow up to be dependent, seek advice constantly, they give up easily, they're not tenacious, and they tend to be socially awkward. So you want to encourage your kids to talk. Don't tell them to shut up when they're six and seven years old. Encourage questions. Of course, there's always going to be a time period where you need quiet. But in general, you should encourage your children to talk. Adaptability, otherwise known as good coping skills. Kids who are adaptable at age seven grow up to be cheerful and optimistic, intellectual, and have very good interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills are how well you get along with people. Kids who are not adaptable at age seven grow up to be adults who have low self-esteem, seek advice constantly, and are socially awkward. So in a lot of these cases, if you go back to your mom and dad and you ask them at age seven, where did you fall on the scale of one to 10 of adaptability, <clears throat> it'll give you an idea of where your current personality is coming from. Third, we have impulsiveness, which is acting on instinct without thinking decisions through. Kids who are impulsive grow up to speak loudly, display a wide range of interests, and be talkative as adults. It's that kind of person who, you know, on Saturday they're golfing, on Sunday they're at the opera, on Monday they're climbing a mountain. You know, these people have a lot of different interests because they act on instinct. If something is interesting to them, they want to try it. They don't talk themselves out of things. People who are not impulsive at age seven grow up to be fearful or timid, keep others at a distance, and express insecurity as adults. So, you know, we as humans tend to benefit from a, you know, a manageable level of impulsiveness. Um, and as we get older, it allows us to try new things. Last but not least is this concept of self-minimizing behavior. Essentially being humble to the point of minimizing one's importance. Kids who at age seven are self-minimizing tend to grow up to exper express a lot of guilt. And that's a big issue because they are feeling shame about who they are and what they're doing. And, you know, really the reason that most kids grow up to have a lot of guilt and shame is because they were not allowed to show initiative. So this kind of goes into it, self-minimizing. No, I'm not, I'm not able to try that. I'm not able to do that. I'm not smart enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not a good enough athlete. Um, and it's a sad situation when you see adults like this. They tend to seek reassurance, say very negative things about themselves, and express insecurity as adults. Kids who are not self-minimizing at age seven grow up to speak loudly. And again, people who speak loudly tend to feel very confident, show interest in intellectual matters, and uh, exhibit condescending behavior as adults. Now, that's not a positive, but it's a characteristic that you tend to see in people who are not self-minimizing. 
you could call them a little egocentric, a little narcissistic, full of themselves. But overall, these kids who grow up to be these adults are pretty proud of themselves, even if the rest of the world thinks they're a big pain in the butt. So the ramifications for the research is that personality is a part of us, a part of our biology, and life events still influence our behaviors. Yet, we must acknowledge the power of personality in understanding future behavior as well. So what does all that mean? In other words, traumatic discontinuity can affect our personality. But in general, our personality seems fixed by age seven. Now, if a parent dies, a sibling dies, the house burns down, some other traumatic event occurs, that is obviously going to affect our personality in the long run. But if no trauma occurs during those first 18 years of life, the personality seems pretty fixed. Next, I'd like to talk about Yuri Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory. And again, what we're looking at when we look at each of these um, theories about development is how do we grow a child? And obviously, we know that it's not all nature, it's not all nurture, there's many elements. And what Yuri Bronfenbrenner did was he looked at four systems that create the child's sense of self and personality. So the first system is the micro system and this is the immediate environment. So micro meaning small, meaning the small environment that the child is in, the family, the school, their peers, neighborhood, child care environment, the smallest number of people. Then we have the meso system. And this is a system comprised of connections between immediate environments. So a child's home and school, you know, when the teacher and the parent come together for parent-teacher night and they begin to talk about those kinds of things. Those connections allow the child to become very consistent in how they're viewed by both parent and child. Then we have the exosystem, and this is the external environment settings, which only indirectly affect development, such as the parent's workplace or different parenting styles among peer families. So, for example, you know, if your workplace is very fluid and flexible about time, and you can get off to go see your kids play during the day or their, 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 con their concert, or you can go on a field trip with the child, you know, that's going to influence that child's development. Um, the other thing that is probably pretty universal for most of us is when we start going to our friend's house and we see how things are being done there. So for example, when I was a kid, we couldn't talk at the dinner table. My father watched the news and we had to sit quietly and eat. Well, I went to my friend's house, and she's got a big Italian family. There's no TV on, and everybody was talking about their day and rambling on. And it was just shocking to me how people acted at a dinner table. And, you know, that kind of exosystem influence can change a lot of how we see ourselves and our parents and the way things are at home. Number four is our macro system. And this is the larger cultural context in which we live. So, for example, uh, one of the big issues is our Eastern versus Western culture. In the United States, we tend to uh, look at things in a much different way than they do in Asia, for example, in the Eastern culture. And over here on table three, I have some of the examples. but. You know, one of the biggest examples is in an Asian culture, there is a group focus, how to work for the, f the group benefit. Whereas in the United States, it's an individual perspective, meaning how do I benefit myself? So, you know, culture can change how we perceive not only ourselves, but the environment in which we live in. We also deal with things like the national economy, is mom and dad out of work because the economy is in recession? The political culture, you know, um, 
It is no secret that in the last 15 years, the rich have gotten richer and the poor and the middle class have gotten poorer. So a lot of economic issues have been encountered over the last 10 or 15 years that didn't exist 25 years ago. Um, and subcultures, you know, depending on the kind of people your parents hang out with. Um, on the one hand, you know, mom and dad may be in a motorcycle club and you hang out with all these rough, tough looking people who are actually teddy bears. Or mom and dad hang out with high money, rich people and who look very kind and nice but are, you know, secretly molesting children. And, you know, these kinds of cultural issues have a huge impact on us. Later, Bronfenbrenner added a fifth system, and this is called the chrono system. And chrono meaning time, the patterning of environmental events and transitions over the course of a lifetime. So for example, September 11th, 2001, when we were attacked by Al Qaeda and they brought down the World Trade Center buildings, they hit the Pentagon and um, caused essentially fear all over the country. That changed this country in a massive way. Um, other things, you know, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, when uh, Bill Clinton was discovered to have slept with his intern despite denying it, when President Nixon resigned from office, the various wars we've been in over the last 30 or 40 years, all of those things change how we evolve and develop. So each system contains roles, norms, and rules that can powerfully shape development. So for example, an inner city family faces many challenges which an affluent or rich family in a gated community does not, and vice versa. The inner city family is more likely to experience environmental hardships such as social issues, alcoholism or drug addiction, and crime. The sheltering family on the other hand, is more likely to lack the nurturing support of an extended family. You know, those people who live in those huge mansions behind gated walls are very isolated from their community, whereas somebody who lives in a row home in West Philly may have a hundred neighbors they can turn to in an emergency. So, you know, the question of, of money is, you know, what is the value other than the ability to isolate oneself. Anyway, that'll finish this lecture. Um, this information will be, of course, on the next exam. If you have any questions, please email me or text message me. I hope you have a great day.